The story I'm about to tell you uh, is the story of the birth of a discipline, the discipline of historical linguistics, uh, which begins in the late 1700s and flourishes in the 1800s and becomes one of the most um, important and influential uh, fields of study in the 19th century. They called historical linguistics philology at the time, um, but uh, it was uh, really, really important um, to a lot of things, some good, some bad. But let's, let's, let's begin. I'm Dr. Newman, this is History of the English Language, and this is Reconstructing Vanished Languages, Part B, The Comparative Method. We like stories about founders. We like stories about heroes who discover things, explorers. And the way I always learned history of the English language, our hero was Sir William Jones, um, he, uh, a.k.a. Junz Uxfardi, as he was known, uh, uh, which meant jo Jones of Oxford in Arabic, I believe. Um, Jones was a lawyer and a scholar uh, from Great Britain. He was a radical thinker, um, a friend of American independence. Uh, he was a very learned man who uh, knew a bunch of different languages. He had studied uh, Persian, which is an Indo-European language. Um, and the late 1700s also, has to coincide, also happens to coincide with the expansion of the British Empire into India. And in 1783, he was appointed a judge at Fort William in Calcutta, uh, in Bengal. I don't know if it's called that anymore. Um, founder, he was the founder of the Asiatic Society of Calcutta. He studied Sanskrit language and the classical Indian culture with a local pundit. And the pundit was a religious scholar of what you might call the Hindu religion. Um, it, uh, Hindus are a little salty about him. And not unreasonably so, because basically he kind of tricked and coerced um, somebody into uh, teaching him their sacred language, which they did not believe in teaching to outsiders. But with the uh, might of the British Empire and in his back and a little bit of good old uh, uh, British perfidy, he um, convinced somebody to start teaching him Sanskrit. When he started learning Sanskrit, he discovered remarkable similarities between Sanskrit the sacred language of Hinduism, the ancestor of a, mod a lot of modern Indian languages, including Hindi, uh, and also um, Urdu, which is uh, the chief language of Pakistan. Um, uh, he, he noticed that Sanskrit, uh, in which I, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and the Rig Vedas and all the sacred texts of Hinduism are written in, had a lot in common with Greek and Latin. Um, and in 1786, he wrote a letter to the Asiatic Society proposing, and uh, we, we, in the United States, we tend to think of Asian and Asiatic as referring to East Asia, but in Britain, Asia refers to South Asia more commonly, but all of Asia um, more commonly. And this was a time of in, increased interest in the East, uh, what is to us the East from a Western-centric perspective. Um, this isn't long before... Uh, Napoleon, uh, you know, goes and marches on Egypt with with uh, fantasies of riding an elephant and wearing a turban. This is the beginning of the uh, the period uh, whose scholarship is documented by Edward Said in the book Orientalism. And, and of course, this is uh, the development of philology is a, is a big part of the development of Orientalism, which which was originally uh, meant like the study of the Middle East, the Near East, and South Asia, in the same way that classical studies are uh, studies, you know, the ancient Greco-Roman world. Anyway, in 1786, William Jones writes a letter to the Asiatic Society proposing that Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin had a common root. Now, it has been pointed out, um, including by commenters on YouTube in my in the previous version of this video that I did, that William Jones was not even the first European to make this observation. Um, uh, several people in the Low Countries had done so um, in the previous century. I want to say Comenius and Scalinger, among others. Um, but he um, sort of pointed it out somewhat systematically, and his, uh, his discovery was widely circulated and directly influenced uh, um, a lot of the scholarship that, were to that was to follow. Um, in this letter, he writes... The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of the verbs and the forms of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that, 
No philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic, by which he meant Germanic, and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the old Persian might be added to the same family. And he was indeed correct about Germanic, Celtic, and Persian, as we shall see. So um, this hypothesis that all of these were um, uh, languages were related and had a common ancestor became known as the Proto-Indo-European uh, hypothesis. And it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty established theory um, based on the vast, vast, massive volume of, of, of evidence that has been produced. How has this been, evidence been produced? It's been produced by the comparative method, which is um, indispensable to historical linguistics and the historical study of language. Um, it involves searching for cognates or related words with common ancestors from the Latin cognatus, meaning cousin. So, for example, in English, mother, in German, mutter, in Spanish, madre, um, in French, mère, in Latin, mater, um, in Italian, what was it in Italian again? Mamma, and madre, uh, uh, I don't know the formal Italian word for mother. Um, anyway, all of these words have a common ancestors, right? They're all, they all look similar. And but what but that that isn't just, that isn't how you do the comparative method. The comparative method is looking for systematic and predictable correspondences between sil sounds, syllables, and forms between two or more languages to determine relationships. And we're going to look a little bit in this video about what systematic and predictable means. Um, we know English and German are related. Here's an example. We know English and German are related because English words beginning with D will begin with T in German in a systematic and predictable way. In English, we have the word dance. In German, it's tanz, T, de-voiced. In English, we have drink. In German, they have trinken. Um, in English, we have dir. In German, they have tier. Now, here's a tricky thing, though. In German, tier means animal, um, not just specifically the animal that, you know, Bambi and we hunt it and stuff like that. But the word deor in Old English did just mean animal and the meaning of it has narrowed over time. Um, so sometimes words that are related don't necessarily have the, um, the same meaning. But but if they're close in meaning, we can still reconstruct a relationship between them. And in English, we have doctor. Um, and in German, it's doctor. Wait a second. Retro record scratch sound. This doesn't follow the systematic and predictable correspondence. Well, here we hit one of the limits of the comparative method, which is that words can, are that languages are not um, isolated from each other. They will borrow words from each other, and when they borrow words from each other, those words won't undergo the systematic sound changes that have produced the difference between dance and tans over hundreds and th uh, um, thousands of years. Uh, the word doctor and doctor were both borrowed by English and German from Latin long after the sound change between, um, that produced the difference between dance and tans, the, between Western Germanic languages and high German uh, produced those differences. And so this puts a little noise in the comparative method. So how then do we carry on with the comparative method? Um, well, the comparative method starts with words that are believed to have changed little over time or not been um, innovated more recently. These include pronouns, uh, you know, he, she, him, they, them, their, uh, numerals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, seven, um, kinship terms, mother, father, sister, brother, cousin, grandparent, uncle, aunt, etc., and sometimes natural phenomena, sun, moon, wind, etc., because all of these are experiences that have been common to humanity for thousands and thousands of years before our present technology, civilizational patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So these are words that are likely to have been in continuous use over the many thousands of years and will have undergone the systematic sound changes that characterize the differences in languages and also are, the, are how we trace their relationship to each other. Um, we can also compare not just vocabulary and sound, but inflectional systems. Uh, refer back to the video in week two on synthetic versus unanalytic languages to uh, learn more about inflectional systems if you're, if you're fuzzy on this. 
But we can see in this slide um, a list of the different uh, conjugations of the verb to be um, in various Indo-European languages. In Old English, we have eom, er, is, sindun, sindun, sindun. I am, you are, the second person, thou art. He is, we are, you are, they are. In Gothic, it's im, is, it, sium, siuth, sint. Note this close connection between Gothic, a Germanic language, and, and Old English, another Germanic language. Uh, Latin, we have sunt, sum es est, sum es est is sunt. In Greek, we have amy, a, esti, semen, esti, ac. And in Sanskrit, we have asmi, asi, asti, smas, sta, santi. Um, now, the santi connects us closer to sunt or sin than it does to ac, but we can see that, roughly speaking, we have a lot of correspondences. Now, interesting thing about the, um, the verb to be in uh, a lot of Indo-European languages is that it's a mashup of what was originally two different verbs, which is why we have one form that begins with a vowel and one form that begins with a sound, a sibilant. Um, as, you can, as you can see here, as you can hear, there are eom, im, sum, amy, asmi. Those are all the first persons from Old English to Sanskrit. You can see that these have um, a lot of similarities, too many similarities to be accidental, as, as Jones pointed out. Um, uh, another comparison here shows the inflectional systems compared of the word for I give between Sanskrit and ancient Greek. Dadami in Sanskrit, didomi in Greek, dadasi in Sanskrit, didos in Greek, dadati in Sanskrit, didosi in Greek, dadmas, didomen, datha, didote, dadante, dadanti, I mean, and didoasi, right? There's obviously a connection between these two languages. We can also look at lexicon, at the different words. And here is an example. Um, this table shows numbers and the names of numbers. We have versions in English, Old German, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. And just for comparison, Japanese and English. Let's go through the numbers for one. Let's go through the numbers for one, okay? One, Old German, eins. Latin, unis. Greek, Heis, Sanskrit, Ekas, Japanese, Hiitotsu. <laughs> One of these things is not like the others. Two, let's, I'm not going to go through all of these. I can see you just like reaching for that L button now. Um, let's, just, let's just do a couple more. English, two, which would have been pronounced tuo in Middle English, tuo. Old German, twi. Latin, duo. Greek, duo. Sanskrit, dva. Japanese, Futatsu. I can I can't vouch for my accuracy in Japanese pronunciation. I'm just I'm just doing my best here. English three, Old German ria, Latin tres, Greek treis, Sanskrit truas, Japanese mitsu. Okay, so we can see that obviously English, Old German, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit all are related to each other. And Japanese seems to be doing its own thing. It belongs to an entirely different language family. Doing these kinds of comparisons allows us to establish systematic and predictable correspondences, which allowed um, early Indo-European philologists, uh, historical linguists, to develop what's called the principle of regularity. And this is a crucial concept in uh, the study of language and history. And basically, William Leiboff, a very, very famous linguist, um, just very recently described it very aptly when, when, he, when he characterized the principle of regularity in this way. Once a sound change has begun, it affects every word in the vocabulary that contains the sound in question. Think back again to the dance versus tance, drink versus trink. Um, uh, so that's one part of the principle of regularity. That's the principle of regularity. And the principle of regularity produces, has a number of consequent effects. One of these is change shifts, whereby a change of pronunciation in one speech sound causes a change of pronunciation on other sounds. The reason for this is because if, if you get sounds that are too similar, too close together, they'll either get squashed together or one will um, be pushed in a different direction. That's called ease of articulation. We, well, we already talked about how sounds will change to make things easier to say. They will also change to um, uncrowd things. So for example, um, 
in English, we have we have some serious um, consonant clusters, like for example, strength, right? And you know, in some dialects, uh, people say strength, right, which, which cuts down uh, some of the consonants that are in there. And then, so so then we, uh, based on these uh, phenomena, we formulate as historical linguists what are called sound laws, which designate specific clusters of sound changes in a language or between a language and its descendants. Some very important sound laws that we're going to talk about are Grimm's Law, which explains the shift from earlier Indo-European languages to Germanic languages, and they are named after the same Grimm's who uh, wrote the Grimm's fairy tales. They were kind of folklorists, and they were also scholars of philology, and they were very interested in, in Germanic things, um, which was less... Uh, sus in the early 1800s. Um, uh, Werner's Law, which accounts for exceptions to Grimm's Law, and the Great Vowel Shift, which we'll talk about later in the semester, but which is a systematic change that took place in English pronunciation of vowel, vowels in the early modern period. All right, so that's enough information for today. We're, in the next video, we're going to look more closely at Grimm's Law in order to um, examine the Indo-European language family and how it turned into German. Thanks for listening.